Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Dan Howarth. Evening. And today, we're going to be joined by John Joseph Adams. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about John? I believe you've got his bio there in front of you. John Joseph Adams is the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, as well as many other anthologies, such as Wastelands, The Living Dead, and The Apocalypse Triptych. He is also the editor and publisher of the magazines Nightmare and the Hugo Award-winning Lightspeed, and is a producer for Wired's The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast. All right. Should we get him on? Indeed, yes. Let's get him on. Superb. And now for a horror interview. Okay, so to start with, I mean, I, I've been looking at everything you've done and there's so much <laughs> to kind of cover. Uh, but I just wondered when you first decided you wanted to get involved in genre fiction professionally and then even before that, what it was that first attracted you to the genre? Uh, well, I first decided to pursue a career in, in publishing uh, when I was I was in college. Uh, I went to the University of Central Florida and, uh, you know, I, I hadn't I'd never done any writing workshops or anything. But then once I got to university, I, I took a couple of writing workshops. And when I was there um, doing those, I I sort of discovered uh, that I enjoyed the editing process, you know, and, um, you know, at the time, I didn't really realize that much of what an editor is doing um, in their in their their what much much of what the primary role is is that you know your it's your curation it's it's you know you deciding what is good enough to be published rather than you know specifically working with stories and and novels and such to 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 make them better uh, I mean that's certainly part of what an editor does but the but it's it's very much a secondary thing compared to um, you know uh, to to the curation. And, uh, but anyway, so, uh, when I was in those workshops, I, I sort of discovered that I, I was, I felt like I was pretty good at, uh, you know, editing stories, helping writers make them better. And, and I, and I enjoyed doing it. And, um, one of the, one of the things I learned in college was that, you know, uh, you know, you're definitely not going to be able to make a living as a writer, uh, you know, uh, or almost certainly not, you know, almost no one does every, almost everyone has a day job. So I thought, well, if I had to have a day job, uh, co while I continued to pursue writing, which I was at the time, you know, I, I've since given, given up, uh, any interest in writing. I'm just, just an editor now, but, um, I, I decided if I had to have a day job, I might as well try to get something that, um, would also be cool. So, uh, I thought, well, Hey, maybe I can get a job in publishing. And, um, so I had family in New Jersey, and so I decided to move uh, move up there and live with them. And uh, it was my grandparents, and uh, and they were elderly, and they needed some help uh, around the house and stuff. So I, I'm you know I figured I could help them out, and also then I could uh, move in with them, and I could look for a job. And so um, you know I got uh, the first thing I did was I got a job at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, uh, which uh, which actually also happened to be in New Jersey as opposed to New York. I, I moved to New Jersey with the idea being that, um, you know, New York is where most of U.S. publishing is based. And uh, I figured, well, uh, you know, a lot of people commute from New Jersey into New York for jobs. And so if, uh, you know, if I could get a job in New York, I could, you know, I could live with my grandparents and then, you know, uh, commute into the city and all that. But um, as it happened, I actually got a job at the magazine and it was already in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, I didn't have to do all that that huge commute. I still had a bit of a commute, but it wasn't too bad. So, uh, so I mean, that's that's basically how I got in, you know, got into the field. Um, it was just sort of a matter of uh, good timing on my part. You know, I uh, when I when I first emailed uh, Gordon Van Gelder at, at the magazine, um, he uh, he wasn't looking for anybody at that time, but um, he suggested I get back in touch in a couple months, and so I did. And right when I did that second time, his uh, his previous assistant had quit, so um, so he invited me to come up for an interview, and I somehow convinced him to give me a job. Yeah, and I guess you you asked a two part question there. You you asked like, well, how did I first get interested in um in the genre? Um, you know, I mean, looking back, 
I basically was interested in genre like all my life, you know, like looking at the things that I, I remembered as a kid reading, like, you know, I read things like the, like A Wrinkle in Time and, um, you know, uh, Piers Anthony Xanth books and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And um, but I didn't really identify as a genre reader until much later. Um, but, uh, you know, in my teen years, like I became very obsessed with Star Trek Next Generation and Star Wars and, and everything. And so um uh, my gateway to uh, sort of traditional science fiction and fantasy and horror uh, was actually through like Star Trek and Star Wars tie-in novels and, and stuff like that. So I started reading those and then I, um, you know, I, I took some detours through like uh, medical thrillers and uh, sort of techno thrillers. So like I read a lot of Michael Crichton and Robin Cook and stuff like that. And um, eventually, I mean, Michael Crichton's really what led me to to like you know, to real science fiction and fantasy stuff. Uh, because, uh, you know, my brother-in-law at the time said, uh, you know, hey, if you can if you can handle any of the science in a Michael Crichton novel, you can handle anything in a science fiction novel, uh, which was basically true. I mean, because, like, uh, even though even though Crichton's books are kind of uh, anti-science fiction in some degree, because science is usually the bad guy, um, they they have just as much science as any, any science fiction novel, um, except maybe for, like, I don't know, like Greg Egan or somebody like that. Like, you know, maybe maybe there's more... Maybe there's more hard science in in those, but um, you know, uh, yeah, you could basically if you can if you can deal with all the science in one of those, you can handle any science fiction novel. But so that's how I that's how that's basically how I uh, you know that that's basically my origin story there, um, and uh, yeah. Michael, I uh, I feel I've got to jump in here because I'm on. Um, I look today, um, you know, your, your bio, John. Yeah. Um, and Michael Crichton came up. I just wanted to ask you because it's something that personally I'm very interested in myself. Recently reread both of the Jurassic Park books. Mm-hmm. Are you excited for Jurassic World? I just have to ask you. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of lukewarm on it. It's like you know. I mean, I didn't love all the movies. Um, you know, I did love Jurassic Park, and uh, and I even liked the the Lost World as well. The book. Um, and uh yeah so i don't know i'm kind of lukewarm on it i mean i'm hopeful um i mean i like chris pratt so i mean it's you know it's a good lead actor in the in the in the lead role there but um yeah i don't know uh i'm cautiously optimistic let's say that yeah fair enough i mean i just you know i know that a a new trailer has recently been brought out and my first thought was you know holy shit they've turned this into a kind of godzilla (laughs) action film yeah, so yeah, I'm. Yeah. A, I think I'm with you. I'm. I'm on the fence at the moment, but yeah. Yeah. Just. Uh, it's not. It's not too often I get the chance to discuss Jurassic Park on the podcast. So I just wanted right. to uh, to drop it in while I got the opportunity early doors. Yeah. 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 You know. I mean, it, it's like it, it has so many things in its favor. Like, uh, you know, for for a big screen treatment, and and it's like, and so like you know, the first movie did a pretty good job, but. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know. The, there's something that uh, it doesn't quite capture that uh, I think that the that the, where the book succeeds, the movie doesn't quite, um, you know, doesn't quite live up to the to, to that same promise. But um, uh, you know, and I don't I don't expect that the Jurassic World will be too uh, faithful to what had been established by Crichton originally, anyway. So it's like it's going to be um, basically uh, basically a, a a completely new you know plot line that uses the general framework of what we knew from before so i'm not you know so like i think like it can't be ruined in that way you know what i mean so it's like um there's only so it's it's like it might end up being a not right movie but it's not going to ruin anything whereas like you know a book adaptation sometimes can you know be really disappointing because it feels like it ruins something no no i totally agree and I, there is one question that i want to ask you and it's quite a light-hearted one um mm-hmm. And sorry for taking this in a total Jurassic Park direction, Michael. Feel free to just <laughs> cut me out. But um, scientists have now finally got hold of the full DNA code for a woolly mammoth. I yeah, heard on the yeah. news recently. And they're talking about, is there the possibility <laughs> that they could recreate one? Right. If they managed to do that for dinosaurs and they did create an actual Jurassic Park, would you right. go? Huh. Yeah, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, I wouldn't be an early adopter, I'll tell you that. I, I would wait and see how it goes for sure. <laughs> Um, see on the test know, room test room yeah goes, yeah you know like if, if a bunch of people go and they don't get devoured by dinosaurs you know sure maybe i'll go check it out but um yeah i wouldn't be among the first to go that's for sure um oh which is funny because as a like a science fiction person like i could 
conceivably like be among a group of people that they might want to like say hey we want to get people to go to this and you know because maybe people are going to be scared to go to it so they're like hey let's get let's get science fiction people let's get like some famous people and stuff to go to this and like report on it you know because like i mean uh with connection like you know cause i have connection to like wired.com and all these kinds of things so it's like you know conceivably it's like something like they, they would get people like that to uh to attend and it's like well no 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 I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, I think I'll wait and see how other people do and and see if they survive first. But uh, yeah. Well, I'll uh, I'll wait for your review before I book my ticket. <laughs> put it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's funny you mentioned the woolly mammoths because uh, I was just talking about this with my wife the other day, and um, I was saying how uh, uh, you know, it, it made me think of Jurassic Park immediately. Obviously, uh, obviously, and and um, you know, so the first thing the first thing our minds went to though was like, well. We, we're not really interested. I mean, it would be cool to have like a real like full size woolly mammoth and everything like, you, you know, you can go see. But um, what we really want is like we want like a like a, a miniature woolly mammoth. So like, you know, like a lap woolly mammoth. Uh, I think that like, would be um, like the mini elephant that John Hammond has in Jurassic Park, the book. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I didn't actually remember that. But sure. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, uh, that that makes sense. Maybe that's yeah, maybe end. that's why we maybe that's why we thought that I just sort of had it in the back of my mind or something, but I <laughs> forgotten consciously. Yeah. Okay, Michael. I've I've had my <laughs> Jurassic Park two minutes. I'll I'll let you crack on. Yeah, you know I have no kind of intelligent segue away from <laughs> dinosaurs and Jurassic Park and back into editing and publishing. So I'm just gonna <laughs> jump back in. Don't worry about it. <laughs> So your first role, as you mentioned a couple of minutes back, was for the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, prior to getting that job, what were the misconceptions and ideas you had about publishing? And also what would you say were the most valuable lessons you learned in that initial job? Mm. Um, well, yeah, you know, the thing is, like, as far as the, uh, the valuable lessons, it's kind of hard to um, communicate what they were exactly. But uh, the thing is, like, I I'm I'm absolutely certain, like, if I had continued to pursue writing, like, working at the magazine would have been the best, education I could have gotten you know because like basically if you're an, if you're a writer and you're interested in, in developing your craft um, like and if, and if you're interested in writing short stories absolutely the best thing you could do is to uh, serve as a slush reader um, and you know for people who maybe don't know you know slush slush reading means like reading unsolicited submissions and you know, which just means you know uh, magazines like FNSF they um, they have an open submission policy which means that just anybody who wants to can send a story in to con for consideration to the editor so it's like you don't need to know anybody you don't need to have an agent you don't need you know you don't need any connections whatsoever you can just submit your story to the magazine and the editors will look at it um, but uh, because uh, because of that kind of policy, uh, you know, magazines typically get, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred to a thousand submissions or something like that per month. And um, while as an editor, you know, you're not reading every single word of every single story because you can tell right away um, a lot of times that a story isn't uh, good enough. Uh, like, you know, within the first page or two, you can tell um, it still takes up a lot of time to to you know, to review all that stuff and to, um, you know, just to, just to even, if, even just like back, you know, back in the old days at FNSF, we had all paper submissions. So it's like, you know, even just to open up all the envelopes and open, you know, pull all the manuscripts out and, you know, <laughs> that, that takes a, that, that would take a, a good amount of time just not as it is. So, uh, so, so editors often would have, um, an assistant, um, you know, help them to, to sort of pre-screen, uh, all this, all the slush. And so that was what my primary job at FNSF was, was, you know, to read the slush. And so, um, you know, I would read it first, and if I thought it was pretty good, I would pass it up to the editor, and then Gordon would look at it, and and if he thought it was good enough, he would buy it for the magazine, or if not, he would reject it. And and you know, I mean, he rejected the vast, vast majority of things that I passed up, but I mean, that's just to be expected because he would also, um, he would also be looking um, at what came in, uh, in into the submission piles, and he would sort of skim off the top, so like you know, writers that he recognized and and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, writers that had been previously published in the magazine and all that kind of thing. So, um, 
but of, of the stuff that was just in my pile, you know, I, I would pass up a couple, you know, maybe a couple stories a day and, and Gordon would, uh, you know, uh, reject most of those, but, you know, you know, bought, bought a few over the years. Um, but, uh, you know, just that, just working in that role, like you just learn so much and it's like, you know, like I said, I can't even really specify what the lessons were, but it, it, cause it's like, it's the sort of thing that you just sort of learn, like sort of by osmosis and, um, you can't help, but, uh, internalize these lessons that you're, you're picking up as you read these stories. Cause it's like, um, I mean, even just forcing yourself to look at manuscripts and to try to read them as an editor would can probably really help because it's like, the thing is, an editor isn't really an editor isn't looking for a reason to reject something, but they are. But you do need to give them a reason to keep reading. And if you if you imagine that you're in a position where you know you have a couple hundred submissions or like even just just a day's worth, say you have 50, 50 submissions to read through in a day. Um, imagine that you have that, and you know you have other things that you have to do as well, and you also want to you know uh, only work an eight hour day and not you know work all you know work you know just work all day. Um, you, you have to try to try to imagine like what the, like what the editor has to do in order to get through all those submissions. And so you have to, you have to learn to become ruthless. And so if you can figure out how to, um, you know, if you can figure out how to do that as an editor, then it's just, you know, one step further to figure out how to apply it to your own writing and to say, okay, well, um, you know, be able to recognize where, uh, something is, um, you know, giving giving the editor enough of a hook to to want to keep reading, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, giving him a reason to stop. And so you said that when you started out, you were initially writing fiction yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wondered, was there a particular moment when you mm -hmm. decided that wasn't something you wanted to pursue anymore? And and just to be clear, I mean, is that something? you now think you've completely distanced yourself from or is there a temptation mm. perhaps later in your career to mm. to revive that role uh yeah you know i mean i i i, I don't currently i'm not like currently writing um and uh i don't really currently have any plans to do so anytime soon I occasionally think about it, you know, I occasionally, like I have ideas for things that I think would be cool. Um, right now I'm keeping myself busy with the editing and I seem, and it seems to be going pretty well for me. So I'm, you know, focusing all my energies into that. And the thing is like the editing, um, actually does fulfill a lot of that same creative need, uh, which drove me to start writing in the first place. So, um, so given that I do, I am able to keep busy with all the editing, um, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really feel like I'm like, uh, like there's any lack of, of creativity in my life. So I don't, I don't feel compelled to pursue the writing at this time. Although, you know, like I said, I, I do, I do think about it. I do, um, I do have ideas for things that I, like sometimes I have an idea and I, just, I, I, it feels like it's more of like a novel idea or a story idea or something, but because it's like, it seems unlikely that I'm really going to do anything with that. I was like, well, let me see if I can figure out how to wait, a way to turn this into an anthology idea instead, you know? Um, so, uh, but, uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe down the road, who knows, um, we'll, we'll see how things go. Um, I, I wouldn't hold my breath if, if anyone's out there listening, um, you know, just hoping, hoping and hoping to, to see me write something. I mean, I don't know why you would, but, you know, um, <laughs> uh, but as far as, uh, there being a moment, uh, there, there wasn't a particular moment, but, um, I'll, I will say that, uh, working in editorial actually really paralyzed me as a writer. And I think that's something that happens fairly often amongst uh, editors. Um, some people figure out how to do it and, and they can balance both like, you know, Gardner Dozois, um, you know, he, he was an editor. I mean, he is an editor and he, and he also, uh, you know, uh, also has been a writer um, for his whole career. Um, to be fair, he doesn't actually write all that much. I mean, he writes only very occasionally, but, um, but he's actually a very good writer and, um, uh, so, you know, I don't know. I've never actually talked with him about it. Like, I don't know if the reason why he does write so infrequently is, is related to editing or if it's just because he's busy editing or, or, or if it's something else. But uh, for me, um, you know, yeah, just being exposed to the editorial process um, made it really hard for me to like to, to uh, turn off my internal editor when I was whenever I was working on something, um, you know, so I would write something and it would be like, oh, this is terrible. It's like the worst slush. And, and you know, like I couldn't uh, I couldn't even 
couldn't even look at it. So, um, so I just sort of put it on hold and I just put all my effort in, put all my energy into editing. Um, and, uh, and I sort of redirected some of my energy, uh, my leftover energy into writing nonfiction stuff. So, um, you know, I, I started writing some, uh, sort of nonfiction pieces about science fiction and fantasy. So, you know, like the first thing I, I wrote was, or the first thing I sold to a magazine was a, an article um, about post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, and uh, there was a little magazine in the UK called uh, 3SF, um, and they only published a couple issues before they went out of business. Um, and actually, they, they I think they didn't even, I'm pretty sure they didn't even... Um, get to publish the article I sold them before they went out of business. Although I did get paid though. So that was something, but, um, so I sold them the article. Um, and then, uh, because they went out of business, I ended up selling it to the internet review of science fiction. Um, and they published it. And so that was my first publication. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I ended up reviewing audiobooks for Locus and, you know, and Locus had never reviewed audiobooks at all before. Um, and so I pitched them the idea of doing that. And so I did that for a while. And then, um, you know, I, eventually I started doing interviews and I did reviews for some other places and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I basically, I, uh, you know, uh, I found other things to do with my time, just, uh, not writing fiction anymore. Yeah, I can certainly relate to a lot that you're saying. I mean, because I write my own fiction as well as editing. And I think mm -hmm. it's just something about knowing so much about the story structure and the process and really dissecting stories that not only takes a little bit of the magic away, but at the same time, as you say, you, you turn on your internal editor mm -hmm. and... As we know, I mean, unless unless you're supremely lucky, I mean, every first draft needs a, a lot of work, really. Right. So, so to have to have that internal editor can make it incredibly hard to to <laughs> even get through that and to persevere. So, a lot that you're saying really does just resonate with me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking that when you uh, when you were talking, John, I was just thinking this is you know this is falling into place for Michael here, really, because we have <laughs> discussions of this nature on quite a regular basis, really, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after you left F and SF magazine, you went to edit Lightspeed magazine. Mm -hmm. And if I've got my kind of timeline right here, that also coincided with the launch of the Geek's Guide to the Galaxy podcast. Uh, yeah, it's, it was around the same time, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, let's see, when did Geek's Guide launch? I, I think Geek's Guide may have launched a little bit before. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was certainly around the same time. Um, yeah, and, you know, we launched Geek's Guide, uh, me and um, my co-host, uh, David Barkertley, and now he's the sole host because uh, I've become too busy and uh, to keep working on it. But um, I'm still a producer on the show, so I help, um, I still help uh, sort of line up the guests and play on the panels and that kind of thing. Um, but we first launched on Tor.com, and we were there for a while, and then they had some management shakeups over there, and they started, and they were, like, you know, they, they, we're doing some budgetary things, and so we're, uh, it seemed like uh, they they didn't think it was worth to keep keep the show around. So so they uh, they fired us, and uh, then we uh, we pitched around to see if anybody else was interested. And so then we ended up on IO9. So it was like, oh hey, that's awesome. We we failed upward. You know, it's <laughs> like uh, IO9 was actually a step up from Tor.com at least in terms of traffic. You know. And then so we were on IO9 for a while, and then and then at some point IO9 did some budgetary stuff, and, and then they, they decided to fire us, and, uh, and then we ended up on Wired.com. So it's like, hey, all right, so we uh, we failed upward again. You know, Wired.com has even more traffic than IO9, um, and so we've been at Wired.com for quite a while now, and uh, so yeah, it seems seems pretty stable, uh, at least at least for the for the moment. Every everywhere else it actually seems stable too, until until suddenly it wasn't, um, but. Uh, yeah, we we've sort of joked if uh, if if Wired fires us, we're, we'll have to like go to NPR or something. I mean, there's like there's nowhere else to go. You know, this we. I mean, if we're going to continue to fail upward, that is, you know. Um, so uh, so yeah, but um, yeah, so Geeks Guide, uh, yeah, and then Lightspeed, we we launched in June 2010, and um, 
Yeah, Lightspeed was really made possible just by the fact that, you know, in 2008, I had published Wastelands, my first anthology, and then uh, later the same year, I published uh, The Living Dead. And both of those books did, like, super, super well. Um, and that just, like, paved the whole way for my career um, as, a, as an editor, out, you know, outside of FNSF. Um, I mean, FNSF certainly paved the way to, to make most of my career possible. I mean, you know, like without, without that leg up, I don't know that I would have been able to do anything that I have done in the, in the field. Um, but, uh, you know, once, once I sold that first anthology, um, you know, and then it did re very well. And then I had a second one come out the same year and that one did even better. Um, you know, that just really made it uh, a lot easier for me to keep, keep selling anthologies. Um, and, uh, so Sean Wallace from prime books, um, I'd actually done a, a small anthology with him also that same year called seeds of change. Um, and, uh, he was very happy with how it turned out and, and, you know, it did well for what it was. And I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't intended to be like a big, you know, like a big commercial book. It was, uh, sort of intended for like more of a niche market. And so like it had a very limited print run and it was sort of, uh, um, a very small hardback. So it was like sort of had a higher price point, but, uh, but you know, but it did well in that in in that space, and you know it sold uh, sold well enough that he was very happy with it, and he was very happy with it creatively. And so um, he started talking to me me, me about magazines, and, and he pitched the idea to me of um, you know doing a a new science fiction magazine. And uh, so I mean it was a it was actually a big decision uh, for me to to go with it because because uh, you know I love FNSF. Um, and note, I still say love. I still currently love it. I, I, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not like, it's not like once I stop working there, I stop loving it. I, I, it's really important to me. Um, and, um, you know, so, and I'd been there for nine years, you know, and, and it was like, um, it was, it was a, it was a big gamble. I mean, it's like, obviously I wanted to sit in the big chair, you know, I wanted to be an editor and, and not just an assistant, but, um, but yeah, you know, it's uh, well, the other thing is that uh, financially it was actually more of a risk, too, because I, w I would actually be taking a pay cut, even though I was going from being an uh, assistant at FNSF to being the editor of Lightspeed. Because Lightspeed was going to be such a um, sort of small press operation, um, I was actually going to have a significant pay cut. Um, but at the time, luckily, I, I had enough other stuff going on that I was able to do that and, and take that gamble. Um, and it ended up working out. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with Lightspeed. Um, you know, we've we've done a lot of I think we've done a lot of great stuff um, creatively. You know, we uh, um, you know we won a Hugo Award last year, so that was cool. And um, yeah, I mean, I just I mean, I, I really love Lightspeed and. Uh, you know, I, I love being able to uh, to have a magazine like that where I can just, you know, publish essentially anything I want without having to um, worry about themes and stuff, which it, it, you know, which is the problem with anthologies is that they're, you know, they're essentially all restricted by theme. I mean, occasionally, you know, people do unthemed uh, anthologies, but those are really, really hard to sell and, and they're really hard for them to make to, to find a place in them, um, you know, to, to find the readers in the marketplace. So, um so that's so that's why it's like you know having a magazine like Lightspeed. It's it just makes it a uh, you know a lot more feasible for me to to be able to publish um, in that sort of in, in that sort of manner because uh, uh, like editing a magazine like that, it's like kind of I kind of feel like it's the most pure uh, way of of editing uh, short fiction. You know because I'm not really soliciting stuff. I'm I mean, occasionally like I'll ask authors to to send me something, but I'm not like specifically asking people to like, hey, write me a story about X, Y, or Z. You know, uh, uh, you know, I might say, hey, you know, send me something, send me something. You know, but then um, the majority of what I buy is just stuff that people are sort of randomly sending me, um, and so it's so it, I say it's the most pure because it's like I'm I'm just evaluating everything that comes in and, and picking the stuff that I think is good from from those for, from what comes in, as opposed to you know trying to curate ahead of time by self-selecting just, you know, these 20 people or whatever, and then picking the stories from there. And in terms of having such a, a wide remit, I guess it means that you get such a, a range of stories uh, within Lightspeed magazine. And then, of course, with the, the horror magazine, Nightmare mm -hmm. magazine, so that you're, you're just not heavily restricted. And so people who are dipping into the genre even for the first time, can kind of have a look at it and and the different flavors mm -hmm. that are offered w within science fiction and within horror. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was always important to me with Lightspeed was to, to keep it accessible, you know, because, um, I mean, I think it's easy for people who work in the field or, um, or, or even who are just, like, long-time readers 
to sort of um, take a lot of stuff for granted that uh, and not take into account um, what a, a sort of new reader uh, or how not taking into account how a new reader would uh, react to, to, a, to a certain story or, you know, because like, for instance, like there's a lot of stories that. I've encountered over the years where I felt like, like this is a, this is like a great science fiction story. Right. But I like it because I've read science fiction all my life and I've read thousands and thousands of science fiction short stories and, and novels and such, you know, so it's like, but, but somebody who doesn't have that background, sometimes I can approach that kind of story and they can just bounce right off of it. Cause they're like, I don't understand what the hell this is. You know, it's like, they just, it's like you need a master's degree in science fiction in order to understand the story, you know, and it's like, so while I appre I can appreciate those stories and a lot of, you know, a lot of other readers can, uh, I try to keep that kind of stuff out of light speed as much as I can, um, just because I want people who aren't, you know, completely devoted to science fiction to also be able to pick up the magazine and, and find it accessible. Um, so I try to strike that balance, you know, you know, to, to please to try to please both types of readers. Um, and then, yeah, as far as nightmare goes, um, and it, you know, you were talking about the sort of diversity of, of types of stories that I would get. And, um, that, that's sort of what led to nightmare is that, um, I just kept, I was getting so much good dark stuff. So, so much good dark material that I, I couldn't publish it all in Lightspeed because Lightspeed being a general interest science fiction fantasy magazine, um, if, you know, half of each issue or, or more was just like a really on the dark side. Um, it would be like, I would have to change the purview of the magazine to specifically specify that, um, that, that it was dark science fiction, you know? And it's like, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted it to be general interest science fiction and fantasy. And so, um, so I decided to, you know, spin off horror, you know, horror and dark fantasy into its own magazine. And, and so we launched nightmare, um, and then that's been going since uh, November 2012 or, or October 2012, um, and uh, yeah, and I'm uh, and I, I've been very happy with that one as well. It's um, it, it pre presents its own uh, unique challenges. Um, uh, I think the readership for horror short fiction isn't quite as high as it is for science fiction fantasy, but um, uh, you know, so we're still sort of struggling a little bit to find uh, you know our niche in the marketplace, but. Um, but, but things are going generally well and I'm very happy with, uh, you know, with the, with the quality of material that we've been able to publish and, uh, you know, and it was cool to, to win the, you know, the, this is horror award, uh, that, as we did this year. Um, and we had a couple, um, uh, we had a couple Stoker preliminary ballot nominations. We didn't make the final ballot, but you know, it's, it's nice to, to see some recognition get there and, we, you know, had a few stories reprinted in years, best anthologies and that kind of thing. So, um, so I feel like you know, uh, there's been some good critical reception. Uh, I think the 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 mass audience out there hasn't quite uh, taken to us yet, but um, that's probably because a, a lot of it's just discoverability. You know, um, we haven't managed to to make ourselves known to those people that uh, would be the ideal reader for the magazine yet. So to talk about the start of Nightmare Magazine, so you kick started it. Mm -hmm. In June 2012, mm -hmm. uh, raised just under 10,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. So, as with a lot of my questions, this is a kind of multi-part one. Mm -hmm. So, firstly, what was it that attracted you to kickstarting? I mean, it's something mm -hmm. that I've seen that you've done with other projects as well, like uh, mm -hmm. wi Women Destroy Science Fiction, and then... Mm -hmm the multitude of of the destroy series that kind of spun mm -hmm. off from that mm -hmm. um and then again quite interestingly you're effectively giving away the entire issue for free mm -hmm. on the website so I'd, mm -hmm. I'd just like to know a little bit about the the start of the magazine and then of course this model mm -hmm. that you've got going on so people can buy the magazine if they want but then if they're prepared to wait and they're okay with consuming it via the website they can also uh, get the content for free that way as well mm -hmm. uh, yeah so uh, the reason we went with Kickstarter for to, to launch Nightmare is that um, you know uh, at the time uh, when I launched the magazine I, I was partnered with uh, Creeping Hemlock Press um, you know who uh, was run by a couple friends of mine um, who I knew for you know for a while 
uh, since like 2008. And, um, you know, we had wanted to do something together. And so uh, once I and, and they knew the horror field better than I did. So um, so I thought like, well, I'll partner with them. And, and since they had a publishing company and everything, it, you know, it helped me to be able to just edit as opposed to having to publish as well. Um, and of course, now the, uh, I'm also the publisher of Nightmare Now. So, uh, you know, it's like they, you know, they hung in there for a while, but then they couldn't quite make it work for them. So eventually, you know, the, we, we all decided to uh, to go our separate ways there and you know I, I just would take over as publisher of Nightmare and and so I've kept it going since but um, but at the time you know we decided to launch it via Kickstarter because we thought well we could instead of just starting from zero we could start the magazine you know sort of with a leg up we could get we could get some subscribers before we even launch and we could sell some you know we could sell some issues uh some 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 pre-orders for issue number one and and we could get some interest drummed up in the magazine before we actually launch and kickstarter was a great way to do that that um i think it would have been very hard to achieve that level of um uh Th that sort of level of publicity without doing a Kickstarter like that. So, uh, especially for a magazine, because I think that there's a lot of a lot of new magazines sort of come up, um, and uh, they just sort of appear, and there they are, and then the issue's already out, and by the time people get around to sort of discovering it, um, it's like they've already had a couple issues out or whatever, and then like maybe by that time, uh, the publisher of the magazine's already like, oh well, we're it's not doing very well, and we're already in a danger zone or something like that. So. You know, we thought uh, if we can do anything to give ourselves a leg up, that 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 would help uh, help a lot. And 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 also the Kickstarter uh, model would actually allow us to prove that there's enough of an audience there to actually warrant doing the magazine. You know, so um, and you know we 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 reached our goal and we exceeded it uh, by a bit. So we felt like okay, well this is this is a good sign and uh, it got us off to a good start. So. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm being, but I've, I've been quite happy with that. And then, of course, you know, like you mentioned, uh, some of the other projects I've kickstarted, and like, so the Women Destroy Science Fiction, and and then we just did Queers Destroy Science Fiction this year, um, and uh, you know, those those both funded at like a thousand percent of our original goal, so they both did uh, very very well. And uh, uh, the the only downside uh, with Kickstarter, as far as I'm concerned, is that fulfillment is really um, it's really complicated. Um, and it's a lot harder than you would think it would be. And, uh, it takes up a lot more time than you think it would. And so it's like, it's almost like a, like a, like a second or third job or something, um, to, to actually run one. And, uh, it, it on the surface, it seems like it's all really easy. And, and, and that, that once you get it set up that it's all just on autopilot, but it's not, <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes and, and especially on the fulfillment side. Yeah. And what was your, what was your second part question of your question? So I was talking about the stories in Nightmare Magazine and how, mm -hmm. yeah, you can buy the magazine, oh, but then right. you're also giving away the content, almost drip right. feeding it on the website. Right. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we do that because um, we figure we can sort of have our cake and eat it, too. Uh, and what I mean by that is that so there's different types of readers. Um, some readers are going to want to read things on their um, ebook reader or on their phone or something. They want they want the nice ebook format. Uh, that's nicely formatted and designed for reading, you know, on a tablet or an, on a phone or whatever. And um, but then there's other readers who aren't really concerned with that. And but and they're also maybe more thrifty or, you know, maybe they just don't have enough. They don't have enough uh, expendable income to, to spend on things like that. So they would rather read it for free. Um, and so by offering both a paid edition uh, that gives you some benefits, you know, by uh a, uh, if you subscribe or you buy an issue, you know, you get the whole issue at the start of the month. So, you know, you'll get to read all the stories a little bit ahead of the free readers. Uh, but also you get like the nicely formatted edition and all that. Um, in Lightspeed, we actually have a little bit of bonus content. Um, each issue of Lightspeed has a, a, a novella reprint that isn't available on the website. So, you know, you get a little bit of extra uh, content by, by purchasing an issue or subscribing. Um, but, uh, you know... Because, so so uh, having both methods of of um, publication there, we you know we're able to get uh, uh, let both types of readers um, access the stories, but then also um, it really helps um, it really helps spread word of mouth too. Because if if somebody reads a story that they really like, like maybe they'll go and they'll run and and post about it on Twitter or Facebook or something. Um, but if they can actually link to the story. 
like I think like it's much more likely to get their their friends or followers or whoever um, interested in to go check out what they were just raving about as opposed to like if if they were just if they had to go buy it um, even if they could buy it very easily just you know via Amazon or or whatever um, you know just the fact that they would have to like be like oh okay well so and so said this was great and I'm sure it is but I don't know if I'm willing to you know gamble you know three or four bucks on it or whatever, you know, but if they could just go and click a link and then read it, like, you know, they're, they're much more likely to do that. Um, and so, um, so I like, I like being able to do that. And I think that's certainly helped us get, um, some critical acclaim and like it, it, it made us more likely to, to, to garner award nominations and stuff just because more, because by virtue of that, more people have seen the stories and, and talked about them. Um, but then, uh, the other upside of having that, um, option is that by having so much content on our website, we actually get good web traffic. So um, we're able to then also sell advertising on the website. So you know, sort of, we can make we can make um, we can make money off the free version of the website by putting advertising on it, and then we can also make money by selling the ebook is- issues. You know, by selling them directly to consumers. And uh, I mean, both together, like you know, we're not getting rich off of this we're like you know we're covering our costs but i mean we're not we're not uh, nobody's nobody's uh you know no nobody's laughing all the way to the bank or anything like that but um you know it's it's a good enough model that it's gotten us to where we're comfortable and we're able to you know we're able to we're able to publish the magazine how we want to publish it um you know i mean i think the, the next step would be to to really uh make it profitable enough that we could um you know pay uh pay some of our staffers, uh, you know, a better wage and, um, you know, and, and even just to pay myself, I'm not really, you know, I'm not taking any salary from the magazine right now. It's, it's all going back into the magazine to try to help it grow. So, um, which is not to say that I don't get anything out of it. I mean, obviously I get a lot of creative satisfaction of publishing it, but, um, or, or publishing both of them. And, and, and also I get the opportunity to promote my, um, my anthologies, uh, through the magazines and everything. And, and we, you know, we get all kinds of, uh, we have all, all sorts of opportunities for, for critical acclaim as well, which in turn then helps me, um, you know, either a sell an anthology to a publisher or B, you know, um, you know, uh, help spread the word about my anthologies to readers. So, uh, so, so in a way, like the magazines can be kind of seen as a loss leader for my anthology business. Um, but, uh, but to me, they're much more than that. Cause they're, you know, because they're so important to me, um, on a creative level. Do you think, um, just going back to the the free content on the website, mm-hmm. do you feel that that is kind of a business model that you would recommend? I mean, it seems, it seems to me in the advent of, you know, Kindles and eBooks mm-hmm. becoming the norm. I think that readers by and large are beginning to expect something for nothing. I think mm-hmm. people that, you know, don't have maybe as much insight into the creative processes you know as maybe as maybe we do or other writers do um mm-hmm. you know do you think that that is a valid and you know increasingly necessary part of your business model to be at, to have to give something away for free or you know what what um, are your thoughts on that yeah i mean i think it's uh it's certainly very important i mean i don't know if it's essential but um but say for instance uh like take if you look at some of the other magazines in the field who who aren't doing that like for instance, like Intergalactic Medicine Show is just sort of a good example, and it just comes to mind because Ed- Edmund Schubert actually just um, wrote a long letter uh, in which he withdrew from the Hugos because of uh, all the controversy that's going on this year. Um, but I mean, he was talking about like uh, you know trying to encourage people to try the magazine, and he had a whole list of reasons and everything. Um, and you know, I've heard people talking about it a lot, and it's like, well. Um, Oh, I mean, a lot of writers and a lot of readers that I know, they're like, oh, well, you know, they don't they don't actually check it out because it's behind the paywall. And and the thing is, like, they don't actually provide any of it for free. Um, I think maybe they have excerpts, but they don't have like actually whole stories. And so um, so that's actually a big barrier for a lot of people. Um, And, you know, even if even if they had like one story for free and then, you you know, you had to buy the issue to get the rest of the stories. I mean, that would be something at least then. you know, you'd have people going to your website to read that one story. You'd have people talking about that one story. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not too concerned about locking stuff down. I mean, we um, not only do we put everything, you know, put basically the whole issues online for free. We also um, we also have like partnerships with other websites um, in which we allow them to publish some of our content um, for free also. So like, for instance, each month, 
um, in io9, we have a story from Lightspeed is published um, on io9. It's, it's part of a series we call Lightspeed Presents. And so we just we, we present one story from our issue um, and then io9 publishes it on their site. And then so that way we can try to get those io9 readers check it out. So obviously that story will get more readers than it would otherwise. But then hopefully also, you know, we can convert some of those readers who happen to stumble upon it into regular Lightspeed readers. You know, maybe they maybe they'll subscribe, maybe, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have some we have a similar partnership with uh, um, Dread Central. Uh, with for for, uh, for nightmare and so you know they do the same thing there where where they run one of the stories um, and uh, so yeah I mean I think it's um, I think it's really really hard to compete with that and I mean partially it's um, partially um, uh, sort of online magazines put uh, print magazines and or ebook magazines in sort of a hard place um, you know by making all this content available online for free. Uh, once so many people started doing that, if you weren't doing that, it put you at a distinct disadvantage. And, you know, I think like um, like Asimov's and Analog and FNSF, they still seem to be doing OK. I mean, you know, circulation has sort of been dwindling, but um, but they're but they're all hanging in there. Um, on the other hand, you know, I'd be really I'd be really interested to see, um, you know, like if Asimov's or Analog or FNSF, if they if, if any one of them tried to do the same thing, you know. It's like keep keep the print magazine going, keep the ebook editions going, you know, just as you always do, and but just also publish a couple of the stories online or publish or publish even more. I mean, heck, I would, I, I, if it was me, I'd be tempted to just go ahead and do the whole thing, just like we do with Lightspeed, you know, because the thing is, it's like I, these are different audiences, you know, um, the people who are subscribing to the print magazine, it's like they're not going to suddenly think like, oh. Uh, I can go read it online for free. I'm just going to cancel my subscription and do that. It's like they, they like the print magazine, you know, because, I mean, if they didn't like the print magazine, they'd probably have the ebook edition. Or, and, you know, there, there's all these uh, there's all these different reasons why people read the way that in the formats they do. Um, and it's not always just about costs. So, um, I mean, I think the more you have your stuff out there, um, the more readers you, you're, you're likely to actually – uh, expose the stories to, um, and I mean I think that's uh, the 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 hardest the hardest thing about um, finding new readers is just getting them to even hear about your magazine in the first place. Um, so to me, I mean I think anything that I can do to um, you know to get the stories out there um, is just going to be beneficial in the long run. And you know for me it's like I said I mean it's basically a, a no lose situation for me since I have you know it's like. Uh, having the free content online allows me to, you know, offer it to, to readers for free and you can get all kind of buzz going. But then also, you know, that in turn generates page views, which allows me to sell advertising. And so, you know, it's kind of like I said, it's a, like a no, no lose situation as far as I'm concerned. But, um, you know, obviously not everyone agrees. So, um, I mean, some some of it, I think, is just sort of uh, a little bit of stubbornness of sticking to um the, the old ways of doing things or, or maybe just um, uh, fear of, uh, of trying something new. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, as long as, as, long as uh, things are working well for everybody, I mean, I don't begrudge them that, and, and I wish them to con uh, continue success. Uh, um, the, uh, the thing is with the, with the field as it is, it's like none of us are really in competition with each other. It's not like uh, – I, I very much doubt that – anybody is like looking at FNSF and looking at Lightspeed and, and they're really debating which one to subscribe to or something like that. It's like, if anything, they're probably going to subscribe to both. You know, if they, if they read both and have liked both, they're just going to subscribe to both. It's, uh, um, it's not, it's not a case where we're fighting for the same dollars really. Um, and if, 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 if all of the magazines do well, that's better for everyone, you know? So like if FNSF does well, that's good for the whole field of, you know, the whole short fiction field. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see all the different models and how they, um, work for the different publications. And, um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're going to stick with what we're doing. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to expanding into print or something, but, um, that's sort of a whole other kettle of fish and, uh, um, not really my, uh, my forte. So, um, we'll see how it goes. We're, we've been experimenting with some print stuff with the, with the, with the special issues of light speed. So, um, and that's been going okay, but, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. I just think that's a really interesting and pragmatic answer that you've given there, to be honest. I think that's 
almost like a breath of fresh air compared to, you know, to some attitudes from other people that you may mm. hear hear from or speak to in the course of of what we do, really. So, mm. you know, I just thought that was, yeah, I was just interested to get your, your opinion on that, really, mm-hmm. to be honest. And, of course, the experimentation also extends to the podcast field because you've got both a light speed and a nightmare podcast mm-hmm. with uh, audio versions of the stories that appear mm-hmm. so h- how's that working out for you in, ter- in terms of uh, you know listeners and also right. just generating uh, further interest and attracting mm-hmm. new readers to the magazines because again it's a different medium a different way of right. consuming right uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, I have to give credit to Stefan Rudnicki, who runs uh, Skyboat Media, and, uh, you know, if you listen to audiobooks, you've probably heard him narrate something or another over the years. Uh, he's, he's like, sort of one of the legends of, of uh, audiobook narration, um, and I happened to get in... Um, get in touch with them uh, pretty early on in my career. Like I, um, when I started reviewing audiobooks for Locus, I, um, I decided I wanted to try to interview somebody who worked in the field so that I could sort of get some insider knowledge of, of how audiobooks are made. Um, and, uh, so Stefan had actually been producing some audiobook editions of FNSF, um, for Audible and this, uh, they, they only did a couple issues, uh, uh, I don't know, like 2003 or somewhere around then. Um, and so I sort of had the connection to him through through the magazine. And so I, I reached out and I interviewed him and, and he was, you know, he's a great interview and, and we sort of stayed in touch over the years. And and the thing that I, that struck me most about him was that he was such a, just such a huge fan of science fiction and, and short stories. Uh, even though, like, you know, it's that wasn't, like, you know, what he was mostly doing in his career, he was mostly narrating novels and, and not just science fiction novels, but all, all kinds of novels um, and, and nonfiction as well. Um, but so when I when I was launching Lightspeed, you know, um, we had decided we wanted to try to we wanted to maybe offer a podcast as well. And um, so I, I just on a, I just took a sort of a flyer on asking Stefan. I was like, there's no. Why would he? Why would he be interested in doing this? You know, I mean, it's like he he does audiobooks for a living. Like, why would he want to do a, a podcast which is going to be free? You know, why would like what would what would be the interest for him? But um, but he was actually very excited about doing it, and and he's been by our by my side uh, uh, on every issue of Lightspeed and Nightmare uh, since both of them started, um, and it's just been terrific. Um, and I mean, yeah, like. Uh, uh, I think a lot of readers discover the magazine because of the of the podcast because you know you go in the iTunes store or whatever whatever your favorite uh, podcatcher is and you know and you're looking for something on whatever topic um, and if you happen to stumble across uh, Lightspeed and you become a fan of all the stuff there the thing is with the podcast um, we only actually have half of the um, half of each issue is only podcast the, and so the other half doesn't get podcast um, so. That that um, sort of works well for us to, um, you know, give away a bunch of it for free in audio form. But then for people who really love it, uh, that still gives them some reason to actually, you know, either check out the website uh, to to read the other stories for free or or to get the ebook editions, you know, um, so that they can uh, read the rest of the issue. Um, and uh, yeah, and I mean, for me, it's just like um, it's just so great to have. Uh, I mean essentially like professionally produced audiobooks of every uh, of you know of half the stories that we we uh, publish every month it's just it's so cool and i mean being such a huge audiobook fan uh, to be able to work with stefan uh you know every month it's it's just it's just really great and and actually um one of the one of the uh, great uh one of the great things about uh um sort of the hugo awards and everything is that because lightspeed got nominated for a hugo um, I eventually just so I, I missed out on this possibility the first two years we got nominated, but then last year I realized that I could actually just add Stefan's name to the masthead when we uh, when we got nominated. So I was able to get him, um, uh, or I guess this was two years ago. I was I was able to get him uh, an actual Hugo nomination when when we uh, when Lightspeed got nominated, and and he was just like floored, you know, because like I mean, being a lifelong fan of. Uh, of, of science fiction and fantasy to, to finally, you know, to get nominated for a Hugo. He, it's like, he, he was completely unprepared for it. Um, and then of course last year, uh, uh, we all got to win one. Um, and, and, you know, so when you win one, actually everybody that you list on your masthead, you know, um, I mean like for up to like four people or something, uh, uh, they all get a Hugo. So, um, so it's not just that I get one as editor of Lightspeed. Uh, also Stefan got one and Rich Horton got one. So, um, 
so I mean, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, it's sadly it's 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 really one of the only things that Stefan really gets out of out of doing the podcast because uh, it's not it's not generating any money or anything and uh, um, and you know he's he's basically donating his time so um, yeah it's like we're all we're, it's like he's definitely doing that part of it for the love um, and uh, you know we we had we had initially talked about like okay well we'll we'll, we'll uh, we're going to do an annual anthology and then uh, we can package together the, uh, the podcast into an anthology and, 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 you know, and then sell those on audible and that kind of thing. And so we did that for the first year, but then um, uh, once prime book sold the magazine to me uh, and got out of the publishing the magazine, um, you know, the, the anthology program sort of went by the wayside. So we haven't uh, released a, a year or two or anything like that. So, um, so even then that, uh, that, that part of the plan sort of went up in smoke. But Stefan's still, he's still eager to do it, so I'm, I'm happy to have him. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. That was part one of our interview with John Joseph Adams. Tune in next time for part two. Until then, take care. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our This Is Horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.